Good morning. What a beautiful day today. Okay, before we get started, I would like to welcome and thank Pastor Mary Brady for, bring, for um, being here this morning with us. Thank you. Okay, for announcements this morning, um, there is a, as a reminder, there is a sign-up sheet in the back for the Easter lilies. There are a lot of lilies that have not been spoken for yet. Um, so they are $15, and there is an envelope in the back, too. So sign up for your Easter lilies, and please leave your um, check in the envelope. Monday, Thursday will be March 28th, Thursday, March 28th at 6 p.m. You need to let either Pastor Ashley or Linda Thomas know that you are coming because they need a head count for the activity that is planned. Stations of the Cross will be Friday, Good Friday, March 29th. That is, will be from 9 to 6 it's a come and go um, for the day, and it invites individual prayer and meditation. Um, there will be stations set up around the church, and you can go at your pace. And then Easter worship will be Sunday, March 31st at our regular time, 9 o'clock, and there will be a breakfast at 7.30. Are there any other announcements this morning? Carrie. Uh, Okay, game night is Friday, March 15th. What time? 6.30, downstairs. Bring a snack and bring whatever game you like to play. <laughs> bring a rock if you want to play hopscotch, Jim. <laughs> Okay, so there is a sign-up sheet in the back for the breakfast for Easter morning. Linda is also would like to have a nice fresh fruit salad. So if you would like to contribute a fresh fruit, she is going to bring strawberries and grapes. So if you would like to bring a different fresh fruit, for that, the fruit will all be added together and stirred up and make a nice fresh fruit salad for our breakfast on Easter morning. So there's a sign-up sheet in the back for the breakfast to what you're going to bring. What other announcements are there this morning? Carrie? We served a whole bunch of people at the food bank yesterday. That's exciting. <coughs> Anyhow, we'll 
That truly is a work of God. God's hands through this community is working through the food pantry. You are correct. Really? That's awesome. It's awesome when we're teaching the younger generation to to contribute yeah pam <laughs> seems like we just got to, we just got done with the christmas shop <laughs> Great idea. I've already <coughs> contacted uh, you know where to drop off. Uh, she said they started spring cleaning, and she has contacted two or three people already asking. So our Christmas, yeah, our Christmas shop is so well alive at the time. It is an amazing work that God is working first through us and now. I wish I felt like spring cleaning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too, Linda. <coughs> Any other announcements this morning? No? Okay. Okay. We are going to sing our first opening hymn. Isn't that exciting, Butch? We're going to sing a song. <laughs> okay. Um, and we don't have the... Uh, oh, dear. Yep. We're gonna, you're going to have to use your hymnals today because Pastor Ashley's not here um, because we don't have the screens today. So rise as you are able... And the number is wrong, in the, the number is printed wrong, it's number 159, the opening hymn is Lift High the Cross, 159. Number 159. <laughs> Yeah, that's one bit. <laughs> one five nine.
You may be seated. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. Welcome this day to the fourth step on our Lenten journey. Today's journey will demand much of us. Come, let us begin again the wondrous journey. Amen. Let us pray. Sorry. Lord, we are such a stubborn people. We find it hard to place our trust even in your Son. When Jesus proclaims that we can have new life, we want to know how this is possible. How can we get rid of the old burdens and difficulties and start over again? How we have misunderstood what Jesus has said. New life is possible. We can place our trust in God's healing care. Forgive us and help us. Gracious Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. New life is given to us this day. We can place our trust in God and follow Jesus' way. God is with us. Amen. Okay, so what are your joys and concerns this week? Yes. Yes, Mary, the the wars and the people who are suffering, of course. Yes. How is Sally Jean? Good, good. We'll pray for her. And Wanda. What other joys or concerns do we have this week? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> We need to keep Dave and Debbie Goodman in our prayers. Debbie had a test last week, and her cancer has moved to her bones. So, yeah. Debbie Goodman. She had an appointment at Mayo's, and she wants to keep that. But Yes, Pam. We'll pray for good test results for Lou. And we did talk about the food pantry, so that's a joy. We, among all these things, it's always good to pray for, for our worries, but we have to throw some joys in there, and we did talk about the food pantry, so we need to throw some joys in there too, so... Yeah, but I'm going to need a nap. <laughs> it's nice. Joanne brought back such a nice suntan. <laughs> 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 
It is sunny, though. You are right. It is nice and sunny, and the birds were chirping as I walked across the street this morning. Okay. I'd like to add to the list, um, my brother Joe, I have four brothers, but brother Joe, the oldest, uh, had open heart surgery this past week. Um, he's doing well, all the, and the rest of us um, arrived in Philadelphia to spend time with him that day and in the days following. Um, he's doing well, but he, as he said, flunked his swallowing test, so um, he's still in the hospital. Please do pray for him. Let us now be in prayer for all the concerns that have been lifted and for the joys. God of great love, take hold of our hearts and let us sit here in the stillness of your presence as we turn our souls to you. Help us to be still and discover the mystery of the living Christ among and within us. Inspire us to turn ourselves inside out in service to you as we clean our homes, commute to our offices, work in our gardens, sit at our desks, or answer our emails. May we honor you. As we read to our children or great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren, as we greet our neighbors, as we walk in the park or shop in the mall, may we honor you. At work or at play, take hold of our hearts, O oh God, and awaken us to the presence of your love, your abiding love. May that love spill over into our lives in such a way that it lightens the path and eases the burdens of each person we meet. We pray all this in the name of the one who came as the light of the world, as love incarnate, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing, stand as you are able. What wondrous love is this, number 292.
This morning's first scripture reading is from Romans 4, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 17. When then are we to say, what then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there transgression. For this reason, the promise depends on faith in order that it may rest on grace, so that it may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is the father to all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence, the things that do not exist. Let us pray. O God of all goodness, we thank you for your blessings, more numerous than the stars, more steady than the beat of our hearts. We now offer to you our gifts and rededicate ourselves to your vision of wholeness. May all that we do and all that we have given be pleasing to you, a testimony to your loving purposes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is from John 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, 
How can anyone be born after having growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Again, please pray with me. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as your word is proclaimed. Let this word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Often when I, when I serve a, or preach at a church, um, I'm asked ahead of time, well, what's the title of your sermon? And, you know, I never know the title until after the sermon's written. So now I'm ready. The title is In the Dark. When I was 10 years old, I, I, was, I so wanted to be a detective. With Nancy Drew as my guide and my best bud, Carol, at my side, I set out to solve a local murder mystery. We combed the neighborhood for clues and turned up scraps of paper that we imagined were encoded with cryptic messages. We left a note on a stone wall at the end of my street asking whoever found it to meet us at the corner at 8 o'clock p.m. Of course, it was dark by then. If he knew anything about the murder, then squealed with glee when a stranger paused and checked his watch at the appointed hour. We were alarmed to notice a mysterious green car driving slowly through the neighborhood at the same time each day that week. Surely they were on to us, even though our search had been cautious and discreet. We continued to detect signs and symbols that we knew would all fall into place once we found that one missing piece of evidence. Turns out the truth was that the murder occurred on the other side of the city, and the police knew who committed the crime, that the man under the streetlight was waiting for a date to show up, and that mysterious green car belonged to someone who came home for lunch every day. But our curiosity was piqued. Our imagination stimulated and our hunger to scratch beneath the surface aroused. Nancy Drew had taught us that things were not always the way they seemed and mysteries were made to be solved. Her chief strength as a detective was her curiosity. 
We wanted to duplicate her dissatisfaction with easy answers. But such curiosity is not always welcomed by adults, right? A child's incessant chorus of why, why, why is met with an exasperated sigh. Asking too many question, questions about forbidden subjects evokes the response, it's none of your business. Or as my daughter would say, mind your biz, mom. Or the oft-quoted, curiosity kills the cat. Soon I got the message that it was downright rude to be so inquisitive. So my curiosity went underground. And now that I'm grown up, well, I think I am. I find that my native sense of curiosity has resurfaced stronger than ever. Leaving Nancy Drew behind, I've become an avid fan of such mystery writers as Agatha Christie and, and Michael Connolly. I've learned to cultivate my curiosity and to honor it, not only as a spiritual virtue, but also as a key to my work as a minister. I've become a de detective of soul and psyche. Curiosity is a cur cardinal virtue of the pastoral process. For example, when I do premarital counseling, I assume the posture of curiosity, taking an I don't know position with them. I invite couples to be curious about their upbringings and current ways of decision making. Why do they think this way or that? Where did they learn that such and so was bad or good? Are they curious about why their families function in certain ways? You see, when someone becomes curious about their own lives, we open doors to transformation and even healing. Curiosity is the first step in seeing things with new eyes and can lead to a redemptive revision of the story of one's life. We might, in fact, call Nicodemus the patron saint of the curious. After all, there are patron saints for travelers, bakers, doctors, artists, fathers, almost every kind of vocation and avocation imaginable. Perhaps if seekers did their seeking under the protection of a patron saint, those of us already in the pews might more easily recognize that Nicodemus is a fellow traveler and a kindred spirit, someone to be embraced instead of judged. Poor Nicodemus usually gets a bad rap. He's sometimes seen as a foil, contrasting with and enhancing Jesus' obvious superiority. Portrayed as a cowardly dolt, Nicodemus is usually spotted skulking about under cover of darkness. He's a Pharisee, remember of the ruling class, ready to betray his brothers to the delight of Christians near and far. His Pharisaic training seems to trap him in the minutiae of the law that our scripture reading talks of. And we can never seem to decide, is he too smart for his own good, or is he in fact an embarrassment to his kind? Too dim-witted to understand about being born again. Did he understand? On the other hand, it's been said that Nicodemus was a man of reason, a learned man, steeped in the discipline of scholarship. Yet here he is, driven by his curiosity, pulled by his insatiable desire to figure out just who this man Jesus really is to him. He begins with a, a statement and sets the stage for speech, but underneath he has a million questions. You see, Nicodemus is experienced in detecting the subtle nuances in the thought of the rabbi. He's skilled at finding the loopholes in logic, articulate in the intricacies of the Jewish faith. Why is it that he seems to stumble here? He follows his curiosity and he finds himself walking on thin air. Jesus speaks and he fans at the words, trying to coax them into an intelligible pattern, trying to understand he asks the question, a man must be born from above? 
yet he hears another. What, is, what does it mean he must be born again? How on earth can such a thing happen? We might ask the same question. What does that mean, be born again? Either way, we see Nicodemus as curious, as a, a wonderer, maybe ch a challenger, but I think he's more inquisitive than judgmental. Yes, he's looking for answers for something new, maybe new life, and so he runs into Jesus. Funny how that happens when, when we're stumped or confused or looking for answers, we run into Jesus. Or does Jesus run into us? Is it a coincidence? Jesus always seems to be there when we have a question or a need or a healing. When they do meet, he and Nicodemus, Jesus receives him as a pilgrim. Depending on how you read that scripture of John 3, Jesus might be uh, reprimanding, but I like to hear it as Jesus being open to this pilgrim, this religious seeker. He welcomes him and is searching mind. Jesus immediately senses that this learned Pharisee, this member of the religious establishment, is responding to something in Jesus' teaching. Even though, he, as you recall, he calls him rabbi. He recognizes him as a teacher. And even though Nicodemus comes in the dark to see him and speak to him, Jesus seems to know that Nicodemus is willing to risk leaving behind the truth as he has known it in order to explore something new. Jesus actually invites him into a new realm of seeing and takes Nicodemus seriously, even as he pushes him far beyond his comfort zone, recognizing a spiritual pilgrim who is starting down a new path. He seeks not to embarrass Nicodemus, nor condemn him, but to offer him instead the possibility of new life. I'm reminded of, of my own searching one dark night in the rain yet, darkness and rain, bad combination. I was 17 years old and I had been in a car accident a couple, or maybe just a month. No, it must have been a couple months later because both my legs had been broken and I couldn't walk for two months. I was at the church, in the church parking lot, in the dark, in the rain, asking Jesus questions. Why did this happen to me? Because not only had I broken my legs, but I had broken my face. Lost nine teeth, front teeth, of course. I was supposed to go off to college in a few months, and how could I do that, looking like this and limping like this? So I demanded to know, why did this happen to me? What was to become of me? Jesus did not judge. Jesus did not reprimand. Jesus listened. And I heard a voice in some fashion, that said, you'll be okay. And I was, and I am. While it's often said that Nicodemus meets Jesus at night to avoid being seen in this illicit liaison, an alternate interpretation is more instructive for us. After all, the rabbis had taught that the Torah was best studied at night when it was quiet and the distractions of the day had subsided, and perhaps we can hear better the voice of God. Nicodemus uses this new, precious study time of the dark to expand his search beyond the standard texts. In this view, Jesus himself becomes the book into which Nicodemus dwells mining every word for wisdom and understanding. And Nicodemus begins this class of sorts with a remarkable affirmation of faith. 
Teacher, he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these miracles except by the power of God. He recognizes Jesus not only as a teacher, but come from God. Skilled teachers know that eager students learn most easily. Jesus recognizes this one right away. Immediately, he ushers this seeker into a realm of wisdom that is more complex, deeper and richer than anything Nicodemus has ever known, using language that is poetic and metaphorical and imaginative. Jesus talks of being born from above. And this word in in the Greek, which the New Testament is written, can also mean born from on high. Born a second time. And even remade completely. Like most of us, Nicodemus, the curious one, is limited by the familiar word world, the world he knows best. He responds in his best left brain, legal scholar, word parsing mode, that would be me. He sees tricks, dead ends, and practical impossibilities. It's all he knows how to see. And Jesus is sympathetic to this. But he persists with his right brain, heart vocabulary, and fertile images of wind and spirit and expansive love. All of a sudden, he starts talking about the spirit. We do not know how long Nicodemus dwelt in this seeming intermediate space between the two worlds, moving back and forth between what is familiar to him and the world, the new world of life everlasting on the wings of the wind of love. But later, we are told that Nicodemus lands on the other side. If we wonder, well, what happens to this guy? We see him again way ahead in John chapter 19. And he's accompanying Joseph of Arimathea to the darkness of Jesus' tomb and offering his new beloved teacher gifts of precious ointment, aloe, and myrrh. At first we see Nicodemus pursuing the path that begins in the darkness of the womb, and with Jesus comes to be reborn, remade, in the dark night of the soul, and then ends on this earth in the darkness of Jesus' tomb. He became a follower, truly. Nicodemus the Curious came to choose to learn of the Savior's baptism of death and resurrection and was transfigured by the Spirit into eternal life. Nicodemus, the patron saint of the Curious, Can you picture him in the flickering lamp light meeting Jesus that dark night? His face an arresting mixture of confusion and interest. And Jesus waiting, patiently waiting, the the silence broken only by the sound of the spirit banging the shutter against the house they met in. Do you see this Nicodemus After this teaching experience, tugging at his beard, of course he had a beard, and rethinking his life, seeing his past and his future through the eyes of the one who loves him. Wouldn't he be dizzy with the possibility of it all? New life, blessing, eternity. And aren't we dizzy with it, too, this fourth week of Lent? Aren't we born again? The mere thought of it sweeps through us and sends us reeling. Isn't Jesus telling us, too, that our lives might be different? That we, too, can be changed? 
we too can be reborn. Amen. Let us stand now and sing together Blessed Assurance, number 369. is our light, our hope, our all in all. Blessed be God, now and forever. Christ is our home, our love, our life, our joy. Blessed be God, now and forever. Our worship concludes, our service continues. Blessed be God.